Thank you. So we thank, uh, we thank everyone for coming here today. Uh, and my special thanks to our speakers today, Medford Mayor Stephanie Buccini-Burke, to Jeff Beckwith, Executive Director and CEO of the Massachusetts Municipal Association, to Melinda Garfield, President of Mass Access and Executive Director of the Westwood Media Center. Uh, this morning, I had the pleasure of speaking with an incredible group of leaders uh, about the importance of public educational and governmental television, also known as PEG, or Cable Access Television. Yeah. From Falmouth to Framingham, Pittsfield to Provincetown, uh, Boston is here, Worcester is here, Springfield is here all the way down to the smallest communities in Massachusetts, everyone came to talk about this threat to uh, local cable access programming. Everyone here wants to make sure that everyone in their community have their voices heard. And this was an opportunity for their voices to be heard because of what is going on at the Federal Communications Commission. In this era of media globalization and consolidation, PEG stations give viewers critical information about their communities and offer an important platform for local residents. Massachusetts residents watch PEG channels to monitor local city council meetings, receive the latest news from nearby college campuses, hear about critical emergency alerts. With 220 PEG organizations in Massachusetts alone producing anywhere from 20 to 100 hours per week of programming, PEG channels connect us to our communities and they enrich our lives every single day of the year. Last November, <laughs> When I hosted a congressional hearing in Merrimack Valley, following the explosions that affected homes and businesses in Lawrence, in Andover, and North Andover, it was the local cable access channels that stayed and then rebroadcast the hearings and all of the follow-up that was going on in those three communities because they are local. Even though we have statewide media organizations, they cover all 351 communities. These local cable access channels, they cover the communities that they, in fact, are responsible for. And they're the ones that people turn to during crisis. They're the ones that people turn to to find what the local activity is that could affect their families' lives. That's what happened up in Lawrence and Andover and North Andover. When all the Boston channels pull out, the cable access channels are still there to give the continuous information about what is going on in the community. Well, today, community television faces an existential threat. The Federal Communications Commission has proposed a rule change that would allow cable companies to shirk their obligation to the communities where they operate. Under current law, towns and cities across the country and the Commonwealth are permitted to require as part of the cable franchise agreements the cable operators meet demonstrated community needs by setting aside channels for PEG stations. Yet. The FCC's current proposal would allow cable operators to assign a value to these channels and then subtract that amount and the value the operator places on any other in-kind contributions from the franchise fees the cable operator owes. What's in jeopardy? Well, Massachusetts peg stations, potentially tens of millions of dollars in funding 
that otherwise would be used in the community. And as a result of these proposed changes in, at the Federal Communications Commission, local governments in Massachusetts and across the country would be forced to decide between supporting local PEG channels and supporting other critical institutions serving the public good, like schools and public safety buildings. That's a Sophie's choice, and it's just not right. And we're here today to say that the Federal Communications Commission should not imperil Americans' access to community television. As local newspapers and other sources of local information continue to struggle, we should be exploring ways to expand and not subtract that the ways that the local residents have to learn about their communities. And we do know that local newspapers increasingly don't have the resources that they used to have, but we can't allow for the local cable access channels to lose the revenues they need in order to ensure that that flow of information continues into the homes of everyone in every community in our state. This access is worth fighting for. It's worth protecting. And that's why I have led a letter to the Federal Communications Commission with 10 of my senatorial colleagues. And I've personally spoken to the FCC, urging it to cease any rulemaking that would damage PEG channels. The FCC should work for communities, not powerful cable companies. That is what they are sworn to do. That is what the contract says that they want to do in a community, to serve the community. And so that is what the federal, that is what the Federal Communications Commission should be all about. And so a movement across the Commonwealth and the country is growing and echoing this call. And together we're saying loud and clear that community television must be preserved. And here, representing the elected officials of all 351 cities and towns, I give you the great mayor from the city of Method, uh, Stephanie Wichini Brooke. Welcome, Ms. Madam Mayor. Good, good morning, everyone. I want to thank Senator Markey for convening this amazing group of people this morning so that we could really hear from the people that know what's really going on in our cable access channels. You guys are amazing and you had some wonderful comments that I'll share a little later. The FCC's proposed rulemaking seeks to cap the current franchise fee at 5%. However, it looks to offset the payment by in-kind items such as market value that they determine, such as peg channel capacity. This offset could be detrimental to local cable services that include government, education, and public access. Funding is needed to staff the operations of these centers that provide education to the public on how to use the equipment, how to stream live to social media, as well as developing community programming. Just last week in the city of Medford, we held a two-hour hearing on our Medford Square revitalization. Who was there from gavel to gavel? It was our public access channel that recorded the entire event. And then the people that are unable to come, whether they're working two or three jobs or can't leave their home, they're able to see what's going on in their community and how then they can lobby for certain things that are going on. But I want to share a couple of the comments that I heard a little earlier um, in the last two hours. This is the last bastion of net neutrality. They speak for the voiceless the Cape Verdeans, the Haitians, all the minority segments of our community. These stations are promoting, bringing safety nets to this, these communities and allowing their voices to be heard so they could better connect with our cities and towns. Youth programming, after school, summer programs. We at Medford High School also have day classes in our center. So our kids are becoming, wanting to become part of the creative community of our, of our state. Community news better educate the community. When all is said and done, our cable channels, a big job that they do is, is really educating our members, not trying to sway them one way or another. It's to educate them so that they will make sound choices, whether it comes to elections or referendums or CPA going on a ballot. It's to bring information to the public, to your home, so you can watch it at your convenience. 
and a couple of other things, freedom of speech. Where else do you get the freedom of speech but on these cable channels? Uh, we see it firsthand in our city, and I know across the state uh, we experience it, where it's really you're able to say what's on your mind, and nobody, nobody says you can't. So these really are the last bastions of freedom of speech. So I urge everyone to fight alongside all our cable access providers, our great senator here, Jeff will speak in a minute from MMA, but continue to write your Congress people to let them know that this is so important. We cannot lose this critical funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Jeff Beckwith from the Mass Municipal Association. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Senator. Uh, this is an example of, a, of why uh, community programming is so critically important. Part of the vision that uh, Senator Markey, then Congressman Markey, had uh, when uh, decades ago he was making sure that the cable industry that was just being formed, formed and organized in a way that was responsive to the communities of this nation and of Massachusetts, of course. Uh, and also that the cable companies in receiving this opportunity to lay wires on public ways to use the public property to build an infrastructure that would make them billions of dollars that the cable companies themselves had an obligation to make sure that this new industry presented citizens, residents, everyone with the broadest array, the most diverse array of information sources and services. These pillars of being accountable to communities and providing citizens and residents and groups with access to share information. Those are the pillars of, of uh, the Cable Act as it was uh, originally crafted and the foundation upon which those pillars have stood has been the Cable Access Programming, the PEG Programming, because that's provided transparency, access, voices for people. And what's the issue today? The cable companies that are making billions and billions of dollars are concerned about supporting with millions of dollars that they already recover from the subscribers in the cable bill the kind of programming that allows uh, cable companies to provide value and service to the community. We're talking about values of democracy because cable company and cable access support open meetings. They support the select, the select board nowadays, uh, or counselors going to meetings and talking and making sure that the, voice, the voices and the positions that they hold are heard all throughout the community. And then that gives other people an opportunity to look in and decide whether or not to get involved and to weigh in. Candidates forums, election nights, local groups hold fundraisers. Over 1,400 individuals and groups have commented just from Massachusetts in opposition to the FCC's proposed rules. One of those comments was from a local Rotary Club that said that over the past 20 years they have hosted a fundraiser that's been aired on their local cable station. They've raised a million dollars for local charities and international causes. They would not have raised a fraction of that without c cable access to essentially involve the entire community. So we're talking about supporting causes, charities, education, youth, seniors, democracy. And why would the cable companies want to, for the, the, the sake of saving a few million dollars, undermine that? Well, because they don't want to have to provide that platform. But we're saying that platform is the cost of getting access to the public rights of way, getting access to the telecommunications industry of the future. Senator Markey has been there from the beginning. He's the most knowledgeable lawmaker in Washington, D.C. and in this nation on this issue. And he is fighting. He already has the entire congressional delegation in Massachusetts lined up and he's working with her colleague, his colleagues. But we all need to work with our colleagues and everyone we know in other states to make this movement in Massachusetts a national movement to protect democracy and to make sure that the industry is accountable. What? to the values of the act, to our local communities, and to providing the broadest possible sources of information and services to the people of the United States. Thank you, Senator. Thank you.
also joined by uh, the great state representative from the city of Melrose, Paul Broder, right over here. Thank you, Paul, for, Thank you for um, joining us. coming. Thank you so much. And next to speak is Melinda Garfield, who is the president of Mass Access. Thank you so much. I'll be very quick because. Uh, it was all encompassing of what you just heard, but thank you again, Senator Markey, for creating an opportunity to make the public aware of the devastating effects the FCC's proposed rulemaking will have on the communities we serve. For the last 30 years plus, community television stations have delivered vital services, helping residents of Massachusetts to be an informed citizenry, educating and empowering residents, and making it possible to get their messages distributed. In its proposed rulemaking, the FCC is attempting to undermine federal law, which protects free speech and repays local communities for the use of public rights of way. If enacted, the residents of the Commonwealth face the real possibility of losing access to their local government meetings, local sports, community events, along with the ability to take advantage of what are now considered free video services in their towns and cities. Massachusetts has the highest concentration of community media centers in the country. This means that not only will the services we provide cease to exist, but a measurable and meaningful economic impact will also be felt. Community media centers spend millions of dollars a year on technology equipment, facility rent, and small business services. We employ hundreds of people and give opportunities to millions of residents. None of this can be replaced with faceless internet platforms. The FCC would have you believe that community media is an antiquated ideal or a relic of a previous technological era but they are simply ill-informed. Community media has evolved from its modest roots to become a staple in the fabric of the communities we serve, and its loss will be felt for decades to come. Across the country, local print media is disappearing, creating media deserts that only community media is equipped to bridge. Our coverage of local government is gavel to gavel, unedited and unbiased. It promotes transparency and allows municipal departments to reach community viewers to distribute, to, to distribute vital information. Through production and airing of debates, forums, and candidate profiles, community media helps to educate voters before elections. It allows for documentation and archiving of municipal meetings, a service that would otherwise cost thousands of dollars annually. The Cable Act of 1984 was put into place so that Americans would have access to technology and a platform on which to express themselves. This was not just done simply for the novel idea that it was, but was done so that the companies making money using public rights of way on municipal land would have to give back to the communities where they sell their products. Even though they are not a law making body, the FCC is attempting to redefine the parameters of the law to the detriment of the consumer. This is not just a community media issue. It is a community issue, a customer service issue. This proposed rulemaking would put more money into the hands of the multi-billion dollar corporations while slashing services that consumers routinely pay for. I want to thank again Senator Markey for his tireless support and for the opportunity that he and his staff have afforded us today. The FCC was hoping to slide this rulemaking by the consumer quietly, underestimating the dedication that so many have to community media and the ideals that it represents. As citizens, we cannot afford to let the benefits that so many depend on be taken away so that the profits of so few are ever increased. We hope that through the support of the fine legislators like the ones we have representing the great state of Massachusetts, community media will be around for decades to come, supporting, entertaining, and educating the people of the Commonwealth. So, we're proud here in Massachusetts that the shot heard around the world was fired here. And it was a perfect example of local communities rising up to have their voices heard. And that slogan, no taxation without representation, still lives in 351 cities and towns. They want to know what their public officials are doing. They want to see what the activity is at the schools and at their uh, public interest groups in the uh, nonprofits in their community. Uh, they want to make sure that the new arrivals in their community, whether they, they be Angolan, or Haitian, or Cape Verdean, you name it, that they have their voices heard as well. That's what is still alive and well. So we're the revolutionary state. 
Uh, and this is where the revolution begins against the Federal Communications Commission. This is where the fight begins, and we're going to spread this across the whole country because that jeopardy is nothing less than democracy, nothing less than the voices of ordinary citizens in every single city and town in Massachusetts and the whole country, and we are in now for the fight. So we thank all of you for uh, coming here today, and if there are any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Uh, our goal now is to have um, what's happening here today replicated uh, across the entire country, uh, to move from state to state, to have uh, voices heard from Democrat and Republican, uh, red and blue cities and towns, uh, because this issue uh, is not a partisan issue. This goes to the heart of what the cable systems are supposed to represent, which is localism. To give each and every community their own stations, their own ability to have their voices heard. And that's not Democrat or Republican. Uh, that's a fundamental compact that the cable companies constructed with our country, and they're seeking to walk away from it by reducing the revenues and making each of these communities have very difficult decisions as to whether or not they can continue to provide that service. So, uh, so we, we, we are beginning it here, but the Federal Communications Commission has yet to put it on the docket for a decision. We know that they're considering it, and we're just beginning this crusade to make sure that uh, they get the pushback, which is going to be necessary. Can you talk about the funding aspect a little bit? How much of cable access television is actually federally funded? You know, how how much of your budget is that really funded? Uh, well, it's not that. Is Springfield here? Who, who, who is the Springfield um, Access right. Channel here? Right back here. Hanging out here. Yeah. So what does that mean to your budget? Well, your budget. Uh, John Abbott. Yeah. John Abbott. Yeah. Um, yeah, come on up here. You should talk about if you. It's a Springfield okay. station, which is asking the question. We have Springfield here, so see somebody else. Exactly. Yeah, so, so please, <laughs> well, why don't we just answer the Springfield specific? Because that would be an illustration for every community. Okay, um, you asked about the federal funding. Um, there is none. Okay. Senator Markey was one of the leaders when he was in the House in creating the Cable Act, Cable Act of 1984. And so his knowledge of it, as it was intended originally, is very, very deep. And his commitment to the cause is still very, very deep. But we've seen, and he's seen as well, well since 1984, the amount of support that the cable, communi cable companies have given has been dwindling steadily more and more steadily. So uh, the funding right now that we receive in Springfield is about 2% of the basic cable charge that the that Comcast receives, and that doesn't include HBO or any of the premium channels. So um, it's every city and town, I think, is a little different. We've learned yes. that today. Okay. So in terms of, you know, what does this mean to your, your budget? Will you not be able to go to as many events? How will this look, how will this play out? We cover town, school committee, city council, you know, big battle, gavel to gavel. I'm sorry, I wasn't ready to speak this morning. <clears throat> I'm a little dry. Um, so, Gallo Gallo the coverage of those things. School events, high school sports, uh, we've run several debates over the last two years that have been throughout Hamden County. We stream those, which is really where a lot of our viewers are, are getting their information. What will we have to cut out? I'm not sure. We don't receive the full 5%, so there's not all that much they could be cutting out. We run the network that the cable, we run the, the fiber network that the city uses for its internal communications and we also run the same all the wires go through tubes on the ground usually we maintain those so we're doing a lot for the cable industry now I'm sorry so, oh yeah, no so I'm just in answer to your question this is, in answer to your question this is not federal money this is a percent of the cable fees which every person in every community pays each month. And the, the cable companies make. So in Medford, it's $20 million. And out of that $20 million, they have to give back 5% of those revenues so that the city of Medford or any one of the other 
351 cities and towns can use in their own discretion, in their own city, in their own town. So it's not federal money. It's actual uh, money that every person pays in their cable bill every single month. And that's what the fight is over, because the cable companies want to cut back in terms of what they provide to individual communities all across the Commonwealth and all across the country. So it's not about federal money, it's about their own money. And just so I'm clear, it's different across the board, different in different Every community has their own discretion to use the funding uh, in the best interest of their community. But without question, it's going to put into jeopardy uh, the ability of these uh, local cable access channels to provide the same level of service they have always provided. And in some instances, it might actually lead to a question of whether or not they can exist. Okay. Senator? Yes? Uh, a few months ago... Who were you with, sir? Uh, Salisbury Community TV, Salisbury Mass. Uh, a few months okay. ago, the... Okay, yeah. Can we, okay. Are you broadcasting right now? Uh, no. Oh, no, no. We're just going here for... I, I know. I, I, just, I just want to have a question, which is, uh, a couple of months ago, the congressional delegation from Massachusetts was not... Um, fully supporting the resistance here, and I wonder if you could s tell us what the status is right now, as far as you know. Yeah, the Massachusetts delegation is on board. We're fighting. We're, we're, we, we, we know how central this is, and we were, one act, we were one of the first states to actually embrace the cable revolution as well, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So it's deeply embedded into the fabric of the communities. Uh, that are represented here, but all across the Commonwealth. Thank you. Question? Yes, sir. Who are you with? I'm sorry. Uh, the Sun Chronicle in Attleboro, Mass. Okay, beautiful. To the best of my knowledge, if this passes, the cable companies would determine a value for each of the peg access channels. There are hundreds of cable channels on a typical cable programming lineup. To the best of your knowledge, do any of those cable channels pay for their space, or do they in return get money? Yeah, there, there, there is. Uh, it, it depends upon whether or not the cable company owns the programming. And then they pay themselves. Then they pay themselves, and that's <laughs> that's the vertical integration which has taken over in the industry back in the 80s. The cable companies didn't own the programming, but increasingly they do own the programming. Uh, and so, uh, how the compensation is then uh, uh, developed for them paying the tennis channel or the Hallmark channel. But the tennis channel doesn't pay Comcast to get on Comcast, no. which if this were to pass, no. Peg would be paying to get Peg, on. Peg, so, so it's, it's turning it all upside down. And it's also saying, oh my goodness, we're giving these valuable channels um, to, uh, to a local community, although it was part of the bargain that they struck in 1984. But when you scroll through all of the channels that are there, and some of them have, as we know, questionable con uh, content, very questionable content. They consider all those channels to be invaluable. Uh, and we know that in many instances we would not want children to even have an idea that those channels are on the system. But they're there. So for them, they can't remove one or two of those channels, but somehow or other they can remove something that goes right to the fabric of communities. And that's what we are going to need to do, is just to explain how wealthy the cable industry has become, how many additional channels they have, and how all they're looking for is, in many ways, just more space so they can put on more channels, but ultimately at the expense of this indispensable local cable access capacity, which they all have. So thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, KBB News, um, what can we do in our communities to make sure that our municipal leaders and officials understand the importance and so that we can continue this fight? It's not just going to happen in Washington, D.C., it's going to happen in all of our communities. So what should we be doing? What should we, as access professionals, be communicating to our constituents? What's the I would process? recommend that you develop uh, the highest quality um, documentary in terms of what the impact is going to be on Massachusetts, have every one of the channels run it. You know, pool your resources in order to make sure that that high quality programming is produced. Then have it be running over and over again as a call to action. And, and then in the local community to kind of tailor it for what would then happen in that community. 
but using that higher quality entry level uh, piece of, um, of a documentary film which you can put together. Uh, and so uh, now some of the communities might have the ability to do it all by themselves because they're so large. But um, that notwithstanding, it just has to be a chorus which comes up. Um, we, united we stand, divided we fall. So we have to stay together, have a common voice which is being uh, spoken. Uh, and out of that, I think it's something that will go right across the border into New Hampshire, into Maine, to New York, out of Pittsfield, up into Vermont, down into Rhode Island, and uh, into uh, Connecticut. It has to start here. It always starts in New England. But once the rest of the country hears about what's happening, then they're going to wonder why they are sitting on the sidelines. So that is what I would say, but I would, I would put it together soon and just start to run it, and I think you'll get a great response, and in it should be a call to action, to call local officials, to call uh, uh, people to say, we want your voices heard on this subject. Any other questions? Any other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. So in an off topic, what are your thoughts on the administration's uh, talks this week about the border, the southern border and shutting it down? Um, the president, is, President Trump is only going to make things worse. Uh, he is taking a bad situation and he's only further com uh, complicating it. Uh, the president wants to cut off all aid for Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador. Well, that money is being used to deal with MS-13. It's being used to deal with these gangs. It's being used within those countries uh, as a way to uh, help the situation. There are problems of poverty, uh, hunger, injustice. If we pull out the resources that we give to them, it's only going to worsen those conditions and only put more pressure on our border. So I just completely disagree with the president. I think he just uses the wall as a political toy uh, without actually talking about working together with Democrats to put together solutions that would work. Yes? Um, I believe Lucy Flores. I think she has a right to speak her truth. I think it's important for women uh, to demand that they be respected. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, critical for all of us uh, to uh, give her that respect. Uh, and, uh, and to make sure that across our society that we reduce dramatically as each day, week, and year goes by the way in which women are, in fact, disrespected. Do you think the Vice President should run for office? Um, I, think that, I think that's a decision which Joe Biden is going to have to make, and then it's a decision which the voters of the United States are going to have to make, weighing uh, his conduct. Senator? Yeah, just wait one second, just wait one second, yeah. Any other questions here? Thank you all so, so much. Much appreciated. Thank you.